It's a real pleasure to welcome back to BBC Radio Scotland Jim Kerr and Charlie Burchill from Simple Minds. How are you both? Great, We're Billy. Great, Billy. Thanks for having us back as regular listeners to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're my two, Reg- <laughs> my only two listeners. Regular <laughs> listeners to the show. Thrilled to be back. You've just announced details of your global tour 2024, and it's your biggest string of dates since 1985. You're going to be playing live at the Hydro in Glasgow on the 29th of March. Are you looking forward to hitting the road again? Really looking forward to it. You know more than anyone what playing live means to Simple Minds. It's been our lifeblood, and you were there at the very start, um, where none of us could have ever imagined that all these years later we would be still announcing live tours and such. But there's always a great buzz. And this week, when you put out a record or when you put out a new tour, the phone starts to ping. People are already looking excited. Of course, being in Glasgow, um, it works out really nice this time because that leg of the tour actually ends in Glasgow. I believe it's Easter weekend. And so we'll have, hopefully, we'll have done a great gig and have a bit of time to celebrate that afterwards. Now, Charlie, the last time that we saw Simple Minds on stage was just a year ago, in fact. You know, you toured to right, promote yeah. Direction of the Heart, you know, in your 40 Years of Hits tour. Now, the date sheet was quite extensive. I mean, James right. Brown or Rory Gallagher would have, you know, went weak at the knees when they looked down the list. <laughs> I think it was in excess of, of 80 gigs. What is it after all this time that, you know, fires you up about hitting the road and going out and playing your songs live? Well, to tell you the truth, Billy, I mean, it's funny because, I mean, again, of all the aspects of making music or being in a band, I think playing live is the best for us, for Jim and I. And um, to be honest, I think it's just that thing where, you know, the, the instant gratification and you go into a different zone when you're playing live. And I think I said to Jim the other day there, I'm really, really dying to go on tour. I think it's just in our blood, Billy, you need to be a certain type. And for us... That's the main thing. And, and you're a kind of real road animal because you can't start twitching after a few weeks thinking, <laughs> you know, when's my next gig? You know, I've, I haven't got one. We're off for the next three months. You, what, what is it that you love about getting up on stage every night, Charlie? Um, well, I'll tell you what it is, Billy. It's just great playing, you know? I mean, that's really... I mean, I know it sounds simple, but, you know, just plugging in the gear and making a noise. I mean, it's you're, like, you're a kid again, you know? Jim's dad, Jimmy, used to say... You two still jumping about the stage, that pair of idiots. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it's like, Bill. You turn into a kid. Jim, you always like to give value for money, and sometimes, you know, Simple Minds will go on stage and they'll play two sets. There'll be an interval in the middle and you'll play for, you know, a couple of hours. But on this occasion, you've decided to take uh, quite a, a well-known and best-loved Scottish band out on the road with you, Delamitri. They're another band like yourself who have a real kind of strong work ethic, yeah. both in the studio and on stage. Why did you choose them? Well, I remember, you're absolutely right, the way you described Delamitri there. I remember even back in the 80s, I think they were on A&M Records as well, and mm. uh, America, and like ourselves, they were really putting in the slog. And it's amazing that, you know, all that effort, all these years later for both bands, it pays off, you know, because I don't hesitate in saying that people come to see us and they come with high expectations. And I know that Delamitri always, always deliver. I'd like to think Simple Minds do as well. It's certainly the in- intention every night. But it does feel nice because, although I don't think we've ever been part of a Glasgow scene, there's, there's no real defined Glasgow scene, but there is a great amount of goodwill between the Glasgow bands and Glasgow artists. Yeah. There'll be people who worked with us, also worked with them or, well actually, we Jim who plays drums. We, yeah, we, 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 Jim we, Jim we, yeah. Fantastic drummer did a, f- a few things for some of so there's always this fraternity mm. um, but more importantly for the people coming along uh, they're going to I'm sure Delamitri will get them up out their seats I saw them a few weeks ago when they played I the don't... Summer Nights Festival at Kelvin Grove Park Bandstand they've just come off an American tour and a very successful American tour oh. so they're going to be on fire by the time it gets to your gigs oh, but there's brilliant. always two there's, <laughs> if you're going to have an opening act there's two ways you could do it you have a great opening act who sets the place on fire before you go on and then you go on and you take it up another level hopefully or you pick somebody terrible which means everybody's got to go out and buy a t-shirt <laughs> um, um, we, we, we've, 
We've tried to do the decent thing here and <laughs> give, give value for money, and I'm sure Delamitri will more than be able to do that. I hate to say it, but when you guys go on stage, I predict an upsurge in the sales of Delamitri t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be playing, I, I asked for that. We're going to be playing some songs through the course of the interview, and I've decided just for the hell of it just to choose live tracks and the first one I've chosen comes from Live in the City of Angels your most recent live album Charlie in 2019 and it's a great version of the title track of your fifth album from 1985 Once Upon a Time what do you remember about recording that album in Los Angeles? Well Billy um, yeah I remember I remember kind of working on it in the bus actually you know you know we were you know, nowadays with technology you can do that while we were travelling between gigs the whole tour actually felt great. I mean, it was a quite an extensive American tour. We played a lot of cities. And I think we chose the Los Angeles shows because it was just such a great vibe. I remember meeting Russell Mail from Sparks afterwards. He came back. <laughs> and, of course, you got to work with him on yeah. Direction of the Heart. That's right, we did, yeah. exactly. Let's hear it now, then, from Live in the City of Angels in 2019, my special guest, Simple Minds, and a great version of Once Upon a Time. This is Billy Sloan on BBC Radio Scotland. You join me with my special guests, Jim Kerr and Charlie Burchill of Simple Minds. And, of course, they've just announced news of their global tour in 2024, which includes a date at the Hydro in Glasgow on the 29th of March. Jim, from the outset, you said right from the very beginning, right from the word go in 1978, that Simple Minds wanted to become a great live band to take your music around the world and you had, a, you had a kind of dream start because in the early days of, of Johnny and the self-abusers you weren't playing to the proverbial two men and a dog <laughs> you know there were there were queues around the block in Dune Castle so what was that like you know because you were in a very fortunate position well, you know people when they ask about our story I'm, I always use the word luck and quite instantly people say yeah but hang on a minute you have worked hard and sure, we've worked hard, but everybody I know that works, works hard. But from day one with us, it was maybe a bit too much to say it was meant to be, but sometimes it feels like that. For instance, when you usually start a band, as you quite rightly say, you know, there's nobody there, or you're plenty of empty rooms. Maybe it was just those times people were so hungry for a kind of sound, and certainly in Scotland, Simple Minds seem to be providing this kind of sound as well as an attitude, as well as a look that perhaps you weren't getting in your normal pub circuit. And so words spread very fast. And when you think of word now, you know, you do something, you go online and you tell the world and if the world's paying attention, you're, you're away. But back then, it was much slower, word of mouth, but word of mouth is the best thing you can have with the greatest respect to having great music journalists who can inform the world about you when you've got a pal who's coming up saying to you, I saw this thing last night and they're playing again next week, in our case that would have been the Mars Bar or maybe it would have been up in Perth or Aberdeen or something everywhere we went you know, the promoters would, they would say, I've never seen a, a young band go down so well or I've never seen an unknown band get that kind of reaction. It's not for us to say why that was, but presumably there was something arresting about the band from the early days. Charlie, we're recording this conversation at a very historic period in Glasgow because this week, believe it or not, is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo opening when Johnny Cash played on September the 5th and the 6th, oh, 1973. Right, wow. And it made the transition from Green's Playhouse, Playhouse to, the, to Apollo. the Apollo. Now, that venue was a huge influence in, uh -huh. you know, shaping my musical, yep. you know, sort of uh, life from then on. What do you remember about going to that place? Because you went to a few great gigs there in the very did, early I days, didn't you? I did, Bill. The uh, first band I saw playing the Greens was uh, Led Zeppelin. I was at that. Were you there? 1972 when they were uh, promoting um, Led Zeppelin. The Holy, I think yeah. it was that. Yeah. Wow, amazing, Billy. And for me, I mean, you know, to this day, and it always will be, soon for Jim, you know that first moment when you go to a venue and you're, especially in those days where you could see the the amps with the lights on and just the whole build-up to it. I'd never, obviously never experienced anything like that. And instantly, I mean, I, I say to Jim quite often that there was that one, one moment and I knew I had to be in a band because it was that special. And um, and I loved the Greens. I thought it was an amazing... When it changed to the Apollo, it was still great. 
still a lot, still a lot of great gigs there. But you know, the Greens had such a it was like folklore, you know, like everybody loved it. There was, you know, Bowie would talk about it. people, everybody, Roxy and Jim and I saw so many shows there, Billy. But it was really, I mean, there will be the most special venue, I think, to me, even beyond Bar- Barland, maybe. Uh, uh, and you were amazing. the same, Jim, because you saw, you know, you know, a lot of people in the very early days, Lou Reed and Peter Gabriel and Steve yeah. Harley and that kind of thing, didn't you? Well, here's the thing. I mean, Charlie and I, we went to Holyrood School, but we didn't, neither of us went to university. In fact, we barely knew anyone who went to university because the neck of the woods we were in, that just didn't happen. You know, you left school and you got a trade and all that. But as the years have passed, knowing that we went on to do and hear Charlie describe it there, I can see that we did go to university. And our university was the Greens stroke Apollo. And... Although we wouldn't have been as... Everybody went. Everybody loved loved the bands. Everybody was into it. But I think Charlie and I... I only realised now, I think we were taken subconsciously in things on a deeper level. Because things that we do now that might say, well, that's a stock trade of simple minds, or if I say, let me see your hands. I remember the last gig, Rock and Roll Suicide, where Bowie was asking for people, give me your hands. Yeah. Well, I changed that a wee bit. Um, um, um... <laughs> Charlie's talking about, you know, he would have seen amps on stage that he then, I'm going to get that. Amp- he'd only be a kid, 13, 14. Don't know where I'm going to get the money, but I saw Jethro Tull with that thing. Or years later, I got a microphone stand that I, I saw Peter Gabriel with Genesis at the time. And so we were educating ourselves. But it's amazing if you say that about the anniversary because my mum and dad were at that Johnny Cash gig yeah oh, really? he, he played two gigs the 5th and the 6th of September 1973 and then two weeks later the Stones played two gigs when they were promoting Goat's Head oh, Soup that's yeah. the ones I went to well wow, really? I was at the Goat's Head Soup tour but I wasn't inside I was outside, outside. in the lane because you could still listen you could still uh, listen um, um, and then that was how much we were in it even when we didn't have tickets for gigs we would go up and stand outside because you, you could hear the music and you tell a great story about you know a guy that you got to work with you were lucky to work with Lou Reed on you know this is your land but the first time you actually heard anybody speaking with an American accent <laughs> was when you managed to sneak into you know, the, the, the Greens Playhouse, the Apollo, to, to watch the sound check. Tell us what happened. Well, you could sometimes sneak in to watch the sound checks, you know. And it, it turns out I had a guy in my class, Kenny Campbell, who his brother was, he wasn't the manager, but he was kind of part of the management. And um, Kenny knew how much we were into it. And, and he'd introduced me to his brother. And his brother says, oh, some, you know, sometimes we're looking for called them humpers yeah. <laughs> then. I, mean, I don't know why they would get me. I couldn't lift anything. But Tony Donald and myself would sometimes go up and it was almost like, you know, being a runner. And one of the gigs, we couldn't believe it, to see Lou Reed. And I couldn't believe Lou Reed because I was so into Lou Reed and so into the Velvet Underground. Tony was as well, Charlie. And we went up and it was, we were helping unload Lou's, Lou's equipment and stuff. And then finally Lou Amble's on stage... I'm just standing in front of him looking, so is Tony. We're just staring up at him. And he walks up to the microphone <laughs> and he lifts up his shades, leather jacket, Lou Reed. And he looks at us. <laughs> There's about four of us. And I won't use the word, but it begins with an A and the last four words is whole. And he points at us and says, get those out of here. And I just thought, Three things went through my head. Lurie's just spoke to me. That's the first time I've heard a real-life American. And the third thing I thought was, he's just called me a... You know. And But that was amazing. And somebody came down and said, and then it was explained, no, they're, they're helping, and he was fine. So, fast forward, how many years would that be, Billy, from that would be for 19... I think that was 74. So 74, yeah. 74... 15 years later. Just 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 when Rock and Roll Animal had come out, because he played the Apollo twice, and, okay. it was, and he had the bleach blonde hair, remember? He says, I don't want these guys hanging around here at my sound check. I don't want anyone at my sound check. 15 years later, Simple Minds are playing in uh, Madrid. the stadium in Madrid, Atletico Madrid Stadium. Lo and behold, who's the opening act? Lou Reed. And as we're doing our sound check... <laughs> 
I see Lou Reed standing at the side of the stage. And I bear in mind, I'm still to be Jim Kerr, it's Lou Reed. And I'm kind of looking at him, better hurry up. Lou's wanting to, want to sound check. I chill, better hurry up. And they're like, Hurry up, what? We're doing a sound check. You'll just need to wait. <laughs> and, and waiting for the man. So the, the tables had turned slightly, but let's be real. Tables never turn lurid. We'll always be on a pedestal, one of the gods. Revenge is sweet. Let's have another live track from your incredible back catalogue and let's go to 2012 to what I thought was an absolutely brilliant tour. Five by five live where you played five songs from the first five albums of your career. And let's choose this one from Real to Real Cacophony in 1979. This is Simple Minds live on stage with Premonition. Billy Sloan on BBC Radio Scotland. I'm joined in the studio by Jim Kerr and Charlie Burchill from Simple Minds. Just to remind you, they're going to be playing live at the Hydro in Glasgow on the 29th of March as part of their global tour 2024. And Jim and Charlie, you're just about to release a brand new live album, but it's a live album with a difference because it's called New Gold Dream Live from Paisley Abbey. Just tell us what the background to recording that was because you did it for a TV show, Charlie. That's right, Billy. It was uh, originally Sky Arts was the show. You know, New Gold Dream's one of those albums for us that, you know, obviously it's a kind of fa- fan favourite, really. And um, we had a few venues, man, but Jim came up with the idea of doing it in Paisley Abbey, which was, I mean, there's something about that album that's, there's a quiet to it. There's so many things in New Gold Dream that evoke a similar kind of atmosphere that you would find in a, a place like that. It was a really inspired choice because... It was great fun to do it, but it just it looked beautiful. Did you have the choice of the album to recreate, or did they say to you definitely, we want New Gold Dream? How did it work? We decided we're going to do New Gold Dream. We decided to do it in chronological order, just like the album. And it was great, because New Gold Dream is one of those albums where it's quite sparse, there's a lot of space in it. And um, we did everything nearly in one take, beginning to end. I think we did... The last song, I think we did a couple of versions of it. It was kind of a gamble in the sense that we knew it would look great in there, as Charlie explained. But Simple Minds Live, it's hard to imagine Simple Minds Live, the very essence of live as an audience. Yeah, we're going to say that because, you know, they've done another couple in the series. One was Two Rye by yeah. Dexys Midnight Runners from 1982. Mm-hmm. And the other one that I saw was The Lexicon of Love, which I think yep. they filmed at the, the London Palladium with ABC. Why did you elect to, you know, recreate you know, New Gold Dream Live, but minus an audience? It was a few things. The main thing Charlie was sort of touching on it there, best way to describe quite a lot of the songs in New Gold Dream is that it's not really a rock record, so that's the first thing. And although there's great pop songs on it, songs like Someone, Somewhere, Summertime, Big Sleep, um, Summed Up There Likes You, even King Is White, Mm -hmm. there's an understatedness about the music. And I just felt, knowing me especially, if there was a crowd in, it would have turned into a sweaty rock gig because then you're, you, by the very nature, you kind of over-project or you're more bombastic. You know, it's just the nature of it. You're playing to the crowd and you're trying to reach out of the back and all that. And that was not the feel for the record. So we'll go in the church and we'll just be there ourselves. Almost, I hesitate to say, make it ghostly, But there was something ghostly about it, and that felt in sync with the record. It was almost more... when It's the kind of record you can play and you can have your eyes shut. It's almost meditational. Let's hear it now then. Live at Paisley Abbey, this is Simple Minds in a brand-new live version of New Gold Dream. This is Billy Sloan on BBC Radio Scotland. You join me in conversation with Jim Kerr and Charlie Burchill of Simple Minds. We were talking about, you know, the New Gold Dream live in Paisley Abbey, you know, recorded what many people think is your greatest ever album. Now, Jim, there's a great quote from you in which you say, you don't get many periods in your life when it all goes your way. Do you still feel like that about New Gold Dream all these years later and all the the music and the, the, the records that you've made since then? Is it still the one to focus on? I mean, there is. I don't think it's just been rose tinted because why would I particularly just 
pick that. I think the thing is to say is it's it's never easy making records. It's never easy writing songs. It's never, but it's particularly hard to get what you've got out your head on tape to get what you've got on on a demo. We would make these wee innocent demos, but there'd be something about them. We go to try and recreate it. You can't get again. But my memory in a new gold dream is is not, I remember that period, a six or seven week period, and we worked in two or three different places. Even the weather, I think if we go back and you go online, the weather was amazing then. Every day, I remember almost kind of running up to the studio, running up Bayswater Road to Goldhawk Road, desperate to go in. Is it really going to sound as good this morning as it did last night when we left? And and it always did sound as good. It just the stuff coming out the speakers. It's almost it's almost like wanted to make itself. And sometimes you get a record where just at the right time as well. Because when you think of that year, nineteen eighty two, there was there was a there was a new kind of pop music. You know, there was bands that you would never have thought would ever have hit records, having them. But biggest pop hits, yeah, the associates, Ake and the money men, the associates, Ake the and teardrop, the men, people teardrop like that. human league, yeah. um, ABC, so on and so forth. Um, just wondrous music, and, and well, so much imagination. There was just something about it, and it made you feel good. And and the whole thing was wondrous, and it's equally wondrous listening to it back now after all this time where. Although it sounds of its time, it somehow doesn't sound dated. Charlie, let's hear another track from the brand new album. It's called, once again, New Gold Dream Live from Paisley Abbey. And it's actually the song, or a live version of the song, which kicked off, you know, the studio version of the album, Someone, Somewhere in Summertime. Uh, yeah. So just kind of tee that up for us when you recorded it at Paisley. How, how did it go? Oh, well, yeah, first song, Billy Bo. But it's a great first song to start with, you know, because... Again, you know, it's, it's very delicate. Someone, somewhere, you know, it was a, it was a great way to start the thing, and it's just very emotional, and it kind of set the tone for the rest of the performance, really. And like Jim said earlier, we wanted it to be very introspective and not to be, you know, we didn't really want to, you know, do any of the kind of normal life stuff in it. So we kept quite faithful to the record, the album. And yeah, we'd first take Billy and that was it done. Let's hear it now then. From Paisley Abbey, this is Simple Minds and a brand new live version of Someone, Somewhere in Summertime. Billy Sloan on BBC Radio Scotland with my special guest Simple Minds. We just played there, Jim, Someone Somewhere in Summertime. And uh, a few months ago, Bono was on Desert Island Discs and his final choice was that song because, of course, that was a big record for the guys in U2 when, you know, you were in the studio and they were in the studio and you were both touring at the same time. That must have been a, a great moment to hear him. Of all the songs he could have chosen, he chose one of your tracks. Yeah, I mean, very kind of him, Peck. The first time we met the guys... Well, actually, Charlie met them. Charlie. I, he met them first. <laughs> where, where was that, Charlie? Well, I was doing a... Uh, Jim was ill. We were doing a show in Manchester, Billy. And uh, Jim asked me if I would go ahead and do this radio interview in the afternoon uh, with Mark Radcliffe. And uh, so I went along, and I didn't realise what I was doing, but went into the green room, and there was these four guys there, and they were great and lovely, very welcoming, and really, really charismatic, something... Yeah, Bono and I had to review... Ten singles that day. I started first, unfortunately, and I was like, ah, it's no bad. That was good. quite good, that wee chorus. <laughs> and then Bono came in, and it was like, Slot of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> the thing I was going to say is the first time we saw them play, we played together in a festival in Belgium. We worked at a huge festival. It was just at the side of the stage, Jones, and he got on on that song, and he came on, and, and then... I think the next day we played again, and I went on, and they, we were always, and they they broke down, and they they started doing Charlie's line in it, and he started singing, and well, all those memories were coming back. As Charlie said that song once. I don't know if it wasn't the first song we wrote in New Gold Dream because promised you a miracle was, uh, but I think it was the first of the album yeah, tracks, right, and yeah. we kind of knew when we got that this is the way to go. It's a door opener for the album. It's a door opener for the Paisley show. You've now been making records and writing songs for an excess of 45 years. What drives you on? Is there a, a, an end in sight? Are you looking forward, you know, five or ten years and thinking that would be a nice way to wrap all of this up? Or are you just going to keep going as long as it's humanly possible? If you'd asked me that a year ago, I'd have said there's no end in sight. There'll never be any end in sight. 
But Charlie's recently got this most amazing house. It's a beautiful <laughs> terrace. It's the sea views. He's just about to put into a big pool of here. Yeah. I think there's an end in sight pretty soon, actually, <laughs> if, you, if, you, <laughs> if I'm to be honest with you. But no, seriously, I mean, we have this thing where it's hard to imagine no longer doing what we do. But I've got this thing in my head, and I think Charlie agrees, that it's a corny word, you know, everyone talks about the journey they've been on, the story they've been on, and we do have a great story. People will be able to see more of that as soon as, as you know, there's a documentary of the band being, being filmed, and it captures it well, but all good stories need a great final chapter, and we've got this tour next year. It's not the final chapter, but I think after that tour we need to get creative and thinking, you know, it, it shouldn't just piss her out. Fizzle out. There should be a great ending to it. And I think, you know, some people say, no, they go, look at Mick Jagger or look at this or look at B.B. King. We love our life. We've sacrificed so much. But you do have to gee, as you get older, the age where it, there's other people in our lives as well. And it's not fair to always... They always come second. Well, whatever you turn your hand to next, we wish you every success. Just to remind uh, people that the Global Tour 2024 includes a gig at the Ovo Hydro in Glasgow on the 29th of March. The brand new live album, which is called New Gold Dream Live from Paisley Abbey, comes our way on the 27th of uh, October. And we're going to play out with another great track live from Paisley Abbey. This is Simple Minds and King is White and in the crowd. Thank you very much. Thank you, Billy.